What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Pick 6 Podcast. I'm John Breach here with Liz J. Doosable. It is Doosdays with Breach. Oh, yeah. Some, some people have never seen us together on screen. It's never happened before. If you're wondering why Brinson isn't hosting the show, it is because he is still drunk from Sunday when NC State beat Duke in the Elite Eight. He'll probably be <laughs> perpetually drunk until the Final Four. And if you're wondering why Brady Quinn isn't here, it is because he heard I was hosting the show and he has a strict I don't work with breach clause in his contract. <laughs> Dudes, you have no such thing. Uh, what's no, up, man. What What is up with everybody uh, bowing out when my guy Breach comes on here? That's kind of messed up. Man. Unfortunately, me and Breach have not been able to work together yet on this pod uh, specifically. I think we did one thing in Vegas together during Super Bowl. But it's good to have you on Tuesdays. Breach, how you doing? Yeah, it's crazy. I see you guys. I envy this show. I'm thinking I want to talk with the NFL guys <laughs> instead of Brinson every week. Uh, and here I am finally <laughs> getting my wish. And as you said, yep, we, we had never met until uh, the Super Bowl in Vegas. And it was brief. We only did one thing together the whole week. But we did it. And now we're doing a show together. I love it, right? They, they were saving the best for the middle of the offseason. That's what they were doing. <laughs> they were just biding their time until me and you had the same identical schedule. They could line us up. And today happens to be that day. All right, man. We've got a pretty simple show today. We've got we've we've made it through most of free agency. We still have three weeks to go until the draft. So we're kind of in not the dead part, but it's it's a little bit slow right now. So we're gonna take a look at what all thirty two teams still kind of need to do. A move they still need to make. Uh, but we're not gonna do all thirty two teams today. We are only going to do the NFC. And uh, we're going to start off with your least favorite division, the NFC West. I don't actually know <laughs> that's your least favorite division. And let's go straight to the defending NFC champion, San Francisco 49ers. Very talented roster, obviously. They made it to the Super Bowl, uh, but they still fell short. So, dude, yeah. what do you think this team still needs to do uh, to kind of give over the hump? Well, first and foremost, Brandon Ayu needs to be signed to an extension. Let's preference by saying that sometimes the most important thing a team can do is take care of their own guys, right? So I think I want to put that out there first. I think Brandon Ayu has become the true number one receiver on that team. And so I have a lot of cryptic messages on social media in regards to what, you know, their GM has said. So we'll see where what happens with that marriage going forward. But when you look at this team, like not a lot of holes, right? And I think that's why a lot of people picked them last year to win the Super Bowl and why I think they're still the betting odd favorites. And maybe Breach, you can look that up and tell me. Uh, I think they were the favorites to win it this year too as well because when you look at their team in totality, there's pro, bowler, pro bowlers up and down the roster. But when you look at the team, I think they need more depth at the offensive tackle position. Yes, they extended Colton McKivicks on a one-year deal, but uh, this is a – heavy tackle draft, right? You can get your tackle of the future. I think they look at it that that position and then corner, right? You need somebody uh, at the corner position. Now, they did sign Isaac Yeadam, who I think is a really good player that can play in the slot as well. But I think they still need a corner on the outside to really help solidify this defense. Love what they did with Devondre Campbell, bringing him over. Also, Leonard Floyd, that was a need, especially because Chase Young won't be there this, this year. And Malik Collins trading for him after they lost Eric Armstead. But to me, the most important things going into the draft, offensive tackle depth and corner is what the 49ers need to attack. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. You mentioned the Super Bowl odds. They are plus 500 right now, which is uh, they have the, they're the favorite. They are the favorite. It's just crazy that people are still doubting Patrick Mahomes. <laughs> yeah. It seems like now's the time to get good value for Patrick Mahomes since they're second at plus six fifty, And it's just yeah. how many, how many Super Bowls in a row does Patrick Mahomes have to win before they Goodness. label him the favorite? Goodness. I, I, the funny thing is we were doing the post game show. I believe it was me, Musso and Danny Cannell. And the odds came out right after the Super Bowl, And I was like, the chiefs gotta be favorite, right? They were like, Actually, no, it's the 49ers. And I'm like, what else does Patrick Money Mahomes have to do to earn the respect of Vegas? Or is this a ploy to get people to throw that money down on San Francisco thinking, you know what, third time's a charm. Maybe they'll finally get over the hump. That's what it feels like. They want them to throw their money away on the 49ers. And, you know, the IU stuff is interesting because we kind of saw it with Debo Samuel. Uh, he was disgruntled. He, he wasn't happy with how things were going in San Francisco. They finally gave him his extension. 
And just to kind of have, it, it does feel like there's at least a little bit of bad blood between Ayuk and the organization because you have John Lynch saying, hey, everything's all right. We want to keep them. <laughs> and then you mentioned the emojis. They were not friendly emojis. One of them was the poop emoji, which you know, when, <laughs> when you're using that to describe your general manager or describe the situation, that's not a good thing. And it was him basically saying they need to put their money where their mouth is and, and show me yeah. the money. So I, I think that is something you don't want to have that drama hanging over your head when you get to training camp. So I definitely think that is uh, one thing they need to get taken care of. And you mentioned the tackle situation, I, specifically right tackle. That is yeah. where you got to get fixed because we all know they have one of the best left tackles in football in Trent Williams. And, you know, if you're the 49ers, that probably is the advantage of picking so low uh, in in the draft, having the 31st pick is that you could find a right tackle there, or as you mentioned, corner. So, yeah, it does seem like tackle corner uh, are their two needs, but they can fix them in the draft. So let's go yeah. on to the Los Angeles Rams. We all know what happened with them this offseason. One of the craziest, just out of nowhere, Aaron Donald announces his retirement. Yeah. So it feels like Maybe something along the defensive line could be their biggest remaining need. What do you think it is, Deuce? Without a doubt. Now, it's hard to replace one player with what Aaron Donald has done and meant for the Los Angeles Rams. It's impossible. I think Sean McVay even came out and said, you can't replace him with one person. You hope that the totality of the defense can pick things up, right? Some of these younger players that they've really, you know, banked on, Ernest Jones and a guy like Kobe Turner, Byron Young, hopefully they can go and pick up the slack for Aaron Donald not being there. But you look at that. Uh, a guy, Byron Murphy, makes a lot of sense. I think they picked pick number 19. Uh, again, you don't expect him to be Aaron Donald, but he has some of those some of those features that Aaron Donald has as far as the, the quick twits, right, the explosive ability, the, the internal pass rush, which quarterbacks really hate. And I think Edge, too. Byron Young was a surprise for a lot of people last year. I believe he had eight and a half sacks. Um, you need to pair somebody with him on the opposite side. Now, they did sign – Darius Williams, who was a Ram before and went to Jacksonville, and Tredavious White, and we'll see where he is injury-wise. So corner was another need for this team, but they've kind of handled that in free agency. I think the biggest need right now is, like you said, uh, Breach, on the defensive line, D-tackle and edge, because they threw a boatload of money, Breach, at the interior offensive line. So that offensive line is locked and loaded. The defensive line is where they need help. Yeah, and absolutely, they need to do something there. I, you mentioned Kobe Turner. I think that, look, it, it, Puka Nakua is probably kind of the rookie that stole the show that everyone heard about in L.A., but just Kobe, Kobe Turner had such a great year and, and kind of got overshadowed because Puka played so well. But, yeah, it, they've got to do something with the pass rush. And, you know, the weird thing, though, is, and you mentioned Byron Murphy, they actually have a chance to get him because for the first time in Sean McVay's career, he has a first-round pick. He's never exactly. had before. He has no idea what's going on. He's like, I have to watch the draft on Thursday or I have to pay attention uh, to exactly. what's going on. So, yeah, I think well, that it, absolutely they have a shot at Byron Murphy. I think uh, another good defensive tackle in there, uh, Johnny Newton, which Johnny I only Newton. know because I did my Bengals mock draft this week and was looking at maybe some of the top defensive tackle prospects. So, yeah, definitely I do think uh, that it really is that defensive front right there that they need to approve on. But they have a pretty solid roster, don't you think? They, yeah, and the great thing about what Les Snead and Sean McVay have done, right, they've done a really good job developing some of those draft picks that you talked about because for the longest, they were a team that says, forget that first-round pick. We don't need it, right? And just imagine if they were able to get that trade done with the Panthers to get Brian Burns. They wouldn't have this year's first-round pick either. So they are synonymous with not having a first-round pick and developing young talent like a Puka Naku who went in the fifth round or Kobe Turner in the third, Byron Young in the third round. They've done a really good job of developing their young talent. So this is a team who hasn't had a lot of draft picks like other teams, but they've gotten the most bang out of the buck when it comes to some of those later round draft picks. And this year, they actually have the honor to take somebody in the first round and develop them as well. Yeah, and the thing about Les Snead, though, is that he's been hitting so many home runs with these later round picks. But Correct. now he, he actually has some pressure on this year because you need to <laughs> right. not draft a bust. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what they do. Let's move on to the Seattle Seahawks. They got rid of their coach. Uh, they barely missed the playoffs. They went 9-8, and eight, tied for the final playoff spot, but lost down a tiebreaker to the Packers, didn't get in. Uh, we've seen them. Get rid of their starting safeties. What do you think their biggest need? Is it out in the secondary? Is it somewhere else? Where are you going, dudes? 
I think it's a combination between interior offensive line, safety, and even linebacker. And, you know, Mike McDonald is new, the new head coach. But when you look at the Seattle roster, uh, kind of like when we're looking at the 49ers roster, I mean, they have some foundational frontline players up and down this roster. Three-headed monster at receiver, two-headed monster at linebacker, two book and tackles. I think that left guard position and where they pick makes a lot of sense here to really rectify and fill that void. Or even safety, you talked about it, right? Quandre Diggs. And Adams have both gone from that team right now. Could they add another safety? Now, teams aren't usually high on taking safeties in the first round because of positional value. But, it, you know, Devon Bullard or, or Tyler Newbin, you know, makes a lot of sense if you decide to take them in the first round or even a linebacker, which, again, positional value. I'm not sure you take somebody that high. Uh, they did sign Tyrell Dotson and also Jerome Baker, but I believe they're both on one-year deals. So you need somebody that that's going to be around for a while. So Cooper makes a lot of sense at the back of the first round as well. Or could they also breach trade back and get some more draft capital and take, you know, multiple players in the second round? I, I mean, that seems like a classic Seahawks move where they're, they're just trying to get as many picks as possible. They love piling up the picks. And it's funny that hiring kind of a defensive minded head coach, how many defensive moves they've made this <laughs> offseason. I mean, not just. In the back half, we saw them. Uh, they re signed Leonard Williams, Jonathan Hankins. Yep. Uh, it, there's just uh, so many. McDonald really focused on the defense. And I think one of the things mm -hmm. you mentioned early was the offensive line situation. There's question marks at guard. And so maybe right. you're picking 16th overall. That feels too early to take a guard, kind of like you, what you were talking about with safety positional value, where teams kind of hesitate to take a guard that early. So maybe they trade back, try and get a guard there. Uh, but it does feel like guard, secondary, or, yeah. Or a guy that I really like, Troy Fontenu, who has some position flexibility, can play tackle and guard. And the crazy thing is, he's already up there, right? He played for the University of Washington in Seattle. So that is kind of the range he most likely is going to go in in the draft. I think that makes a lot of sense, too. He's athletic enough to stay at tackle, but you have two bookend tackles. He'd be a really good guard, too, and a plug-and-play guy for the Seattle Seahawks. Yeah, and since they picked 16th overall, they probably wouldn't feel like they're reaching, uh, taking him. And I'm sure he's his agent's calling up like, please take him. We don't want to move. He's happy here. He <laughs> we, don't wanna <laughs> we don't want to leave. We don't want to leave. This place is great. Um, all right. And then, of course, we have to talk about the team that uh, doesn't ever get any love because they've been so bad over the past couple years. <laughs> I, dude, I don't even know what this team is doing anymore. It's the Arizona Cardinals. What? What? Is, everything is a need. What's their main need? <laughs> I mean, when you look at it, they need a number one receiver. They lost Randall Moore and Hollywood Brown, right? So they need a number one receiver. I think they just signed Josh Reynolds, if I'm not mistaken, but he's more of a two-slash-three type guy. Um, you know, a lot of people have kind of pegged him to take Marvin Harrison Jr., which makes a lot of sense at the number four spot. Should, should it go quarterback, quarterback, quarterback? Right, Marvin Harrison Jr. would fall into your lap at the number four spot. So receiver is big. Edge, they need an edge guy to come off the edge and be consistent. And also they need another corner as well. So like you said, this team has a lot of needs, right? This was a team I think that was picked to finish dead law at last in regards to Super Bowl odds last year. And the crazy thing is they've actually lost players instead of actually getting better. Now, they got better at the defensive tackle position, right? And I think they signed Jonah Williams, if I'm not mistaken, to, to play – uh, go back to left tackle, right? Because Paris was playing left. He was playing right tackle last year. So it'll be interesting to see how they that that dynamic works because Jonah Williams was playing right tackle last year for the Bengals. So is he going to go back to left tackle now or will Paris go to left tackle? So I, I, like you said, Breach, they have so many uh, issues, not issues, but they have so many needs on their team, right? I think Marvin Harrison Jr. makes a lot of sense. And then after that, I would not be surprised if they just go best player available throughout the rest of the draft. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that they have so many holes and that, look, Marvin Harrison Jr. seems like an obvious pick, an easy pick, but mm -hmm. you also have to consider that, hey, look, we have so many holes. Maybe we trade back to six or seven. We try and get Malik Neighbors or another one of these top three receivers and just add some picks because if you could add another first-round pick, if the Vikings call up and they're desperate and they say, hey, we'll give you our 23rd pick and our 11th pick to move up to four. I mean, you have to consider it because you have so many holes, like you said. But what were they thinking? They just gave away Rondo Moore to the Falcons for a backup. What are they doing, dudes? I want to know, like, it's it's been really weird with Rondo Moore because he has a really good skill set, right? He's not just 
a, you know, Swiss Army knife where you can maybe give him in around. Like, he can actually play football really well. I think, to me, he could be a high quality, too, if people actually use them the proper way, right? I mean, this guy's lower body strength, Reese, his explosiveness is ridiculous. And it just seems like every coach or coaching regime he's been through in Arizona now, maybe this has something to do with him. Uh, they just, I guess they don't see the vision, right? And like you said, they essentially just gave him away in a trade-off with Desmond Ritter to the Atlanta Falcons. And the Atlanta Falcons were like, shoot, we, we'll take that skill set all day long, right? Put him in the backfield. We can put him in the slot, even though they did, you know, sign the slot receiver this offseason. But I, I just don't get why he hasn't been used properly on all the team or in Arizona. Hopefully the Atlanta Falcons use him well. And that could just be a situation where the Cardinals just don't know what they're doing because you look at Hollywood Brown. He had – I think a thousand yard season during his final year with the Ravens, he gets to Arizona and he doesn't do nothing. He had a couple, both seasons went over 500 yards, but he definitely didn't have the production that he had in Baltimore. So it could just be the Cardinals just don't know what they're doing on offense. Um, speaking of no offense, we're going to take a break and we'll try and figure out what the Cowboys are doing on offense Oof. and defense. Cause we're going to talk about the NFC East biggest needs next. It's a championship preview from the Final Four as our We Need to Talk team brings you all the madness Sunday on CBS. All right, dudes, it's fitting that they are America's team because I think America is trying to figure out what this team is doing in free agency. Uh, it has been just nothing. It's been essentially <laughs> nothing. They're all in, though, Breach. Remember, they're all in. <laughs> yeah, they're all in. They're, Jerry, Jerry says they're all in. They're all in. So you're looking at this team who yeah. is apparently all in. What What is their next move? They haven't even really made a move. What's their next move? Well, there's so much to dig into when you look at the Dallas Cowboys because you got to go back to Jerry's remarks you know, pre-playoffs last year. And he said, this team will only go as far as Dak Prescott takes us, right? Then he gets asked and peppered with questions at the Singer Bowl. And his response and the way he kind of said it was interesting, Breach, because he was like, I told you we'd only go as far as Dak took us, and we went as far as he took us. So to me, when an owner says something like that, is there true faith and belief that Dak can take that next step to get them to an NFC Championship game? And I remember asking our very own Brady Quinn and Danny Cannell, I asked him this question because I hadn't heard anybody ask this question. I was like, is there any scenario, and this was literally like a month, and, a month, maybe a month and a half ago, Breach, where you see the Dallas Cowboys, even though Dak's Prescott number is unprecedented, unprecedented at 60 plus million as a cap it is there any scenario do you see them having him play that out and then him being the free agent they were like no no way and the reason i asked that just because i was reading jerry jones's body language he was kind of telling you which direction they were shifting in now you got to be careful if you're jerry jones because the grass isn't always greener on the other side i think people you know get enamored with what patrick mahomes can do but that's the reason why He's a mini goat, right? There's not a lot of Patrick Mahomes or Joe Burrows walking around. So my thing is, if you replace Dak Prescott, you better have a really good plan to replace him because you're talking about a team that, has, if I'm not mistaken, had 12 wins in three straight seasons. Like, that's hard to do, and it's hard to replace. Yes, they've bought him out in the playoffs, but they've gotten to the playoffs where a lot of teams would wish for that type of success. The Dallas Cowboys are like, because they're the star, it's not enough. So – It'll be interesting to see how things play out. And maybe Jerry Jones saying we're going all in means we're going to absolutely do nothing so people talk about us, <laughs> right? Ah, that that's exactly what has happened. <laughs> it, yeah, it, it is crazy. And it does seem like reading Jerry's body language and kind of his uh, comments that it's not exactly a vote of confidence for Dak Prescott that, hey, look, we're going to slow down, not really talk about a new contract right now. And, you know, if you're Dak Prescott, I don't see how this works out well for Jerry because if the Cowboys are bad this season, then you don't re you don't give Dak a new contract. You move on. You take a huge dead cap hit in 2025, and you have crazy. to find a new quarterback. If Dak leads you to the Super Bowl, then you're going to be paying him $70 million a year because you were right. too dumb to give him an extension right now. So, like, there's no upside, really, to letting him play the contract out. Well, isn't this the same scenario that happened when he was about to hit free agency the first time, right? And he ends up getting hurt, and Dallas saw what life was like without him, and then they end up making him the highest-paid quarterback coming off an of injury. And then you can even take it one step further, Breach. Kirk Cousins, if I'm not mistaken, is 36 or 37 years old, and he's coming off a torn Achilles. 
Brees, what did he just get paid per year? A lot. Four years. Fifty one. million dollars. <laughs> like, what do you think Dak Prescott is going to get on the open market? Like, and again, I do think Dak needs to play better in you know critical situations in the playoffs. But again, unless you have an alternative answer, like, what are you going to do? Who are you going to pick to play in Dallas? Because we know you're under a microscope when you play for the star. Not everybody can handle that type of pressure. Dak has been able to do it with class. He hasn't been in, hasn't had any trouble off the field, right? Now, again, you want him to perform his best when it's critical, but what's the opposite of what, what else can you do? Because guys like Patrick Mahomes, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Justin Herbert, they're not being made available to trade for. So what is your answer ultimately? Is it to go to the draft? Which in one of my mock drafts, I actually had him taking Michael Penix Jr. because of the situation at pick 18. He could sit for a year and then potentially take over the next year. I think it makes a lot of sense. But that would be their only route, right? Is to go through the draft and try to find a franchise quarterback in the future. But you talked about it. That dead cap hit is so enormous. Like, again, Dak has all the leverage in this situation right now. But uh, let me get back to the original question. What do they need? Um, offensive tackle for sure, right? They lost Tyron Smith. Uh, there's been rumors that the other Smith could potentially move back to left tackle. But I think that would be a mistake. He's been a all-pro guard. I would leave him at guard. So I think they need to fill that void at tackle either via draft or try to find somebody to trade for. Receiver is another spot, right? I think – if I'm not mistaken, I think Brandon Cooks is in his last year's deal, and then CeeDee Lamb is about to get paid. You need to bring in another young receiver. And then who's starting at running back for the Dallas Cowboys right now? I think if the season started, Deuce Vaughn would be the starting running back right now for the Dallas Cowboys. So they need a running back as well. So they have a lot of issues for a team that, you know, consistently wins and goes to the playoffs. There's a lot of holes on this team right now. Yeah, and you know what's funny is that every hole you mentioned is on offense, and guess who's going to have to make that offense look good despite all those holes? Dak Prescott, the guy you don't want to pay. Stand him up for a fail. Exactly. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it's you're putting so much pressure on him. Be like, okay, well, we're not going to give you a third wide receiver. Brandon Cooks is kind of old. C.D. Lamb's obviously a, a, a legit number one, but you don't have a lot of depth there. And as you said, maybe Tyler Smith is the left tackle, but probably better at guard. So you've got a little bit of question mark at left tackle. And like you mentioned, there's no running back. So I, Dak's going to have to carry the load. So I don't even, I, I don't know what this plan is. I don't know what they're doing. Yeah, they're all in breach. Like, and that's the thing people have been wondering. I'm like, are, is Jerry trying to sabotage Dak? Because you're asking him to do more, right? By not giving him an extension and lowering his cap hit. But he literally has no weapons to work with, right? Not only did Tyron Smith leave, Tyler Biotis left. And not only did he leave, he went to a divisional foe in the Washington Commanders. So, like, not only did they steal your center, they got stronger within the division by stealing your center. So, there's a lot of needs on offense. And that's why people are questioning, like, what Jerry Jones is, Jerry Jones is doing. Like, if you're not, you know, going to restructure Dak, at least try to figure out something to give him some help to actually – so he can actually have success on offense. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think anyone knows what Jerry Jones is doing. I don't think he knows what he's doing. And maybe that's why they haven't been to a conference title game since 1995. But well, you know who has been to a conference title game since 1995? The Philadelphia yeah. Eagles. Look, we talked about Aaron Donald's retirement a little bit earlier with the Rams. Eagles have also been hit by a couple retirements. Jason Kelsey, Fletcher Cox. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a team that melted down down the stretch. And, uh, you know, losing your center is not ideal. Dues, what do you think is this team's biggest need right now? I think it has to be the secondary. When you look at the secondary, James Bradbury and also big play slayer getting up there in age, right? I think you need to attack the secondary. And they did, you know, went and signed CJ Gardner Johnson, right? And I think they just gave Reed Blankenship some type of extension as well. Um, I think Cooper DeGean makes a lot of sense in the first round. A guy that can play multiple positions in that secondary. He can play in the slot. He can play safety. He can play on the outside at corner as well. Then you look at offensive tackle, right? Lane Johnson's getting up there in age. I know you said Kelsey is left, but Cam Jurgens was literally groomed to come in behind uh, Jason Kelsey and take over at center. So I think they'll be fine when it comes to the in interior offensive line. I think maybe even in the second or third round, attack that offensive tackle position just because Lane Johnson is getting up there in age. And then linebacker too, right? You did sign Devin White, but N'Kobe Dean has struggled to stay healthy. Devin White is probably coming off his worst career year in football. I think they need to attack that linebacking position as well. Yeah, and it does seem like, at least 
the secondary, which is the first one you mentioned, has been an issue for them uh, just for whatever reason. And and they've attacked it. They've Scheme, tried to- coaching, <laughs> players yeah, every- getting up their age. <laughs> it's just, it, nothing will work. It's cursed. They can't make anything. Uh, you know, we'll see if C.J. Gardner-Johnson will help out there. And as you mm-hmm. said, when you have guys like Darius Slane, James Bradbury, you expect them to form at a certain level. And when they don't, kind of leaves you stuck between a rock and a hard place because you're thinking, well, we need to bring in someone else. But then mm-hmm. you're also hoping these guys will re-up and play at the level they were playing at a few years ago. So, I, yeah, I do think it'll be interesting to see what the Eagles do going forward. Uh, let's get to the New York Football Giants. Um, man, this team, a lot of issues last season. The owner calling out Brian Dable at the owner's meeting. I mean, everything's going on. We don't know what's up with Daniel Jones. What's this team's biggest need? Uh, I think they need a true number one receiver, first and foremost. They need somebody that can help Daniel Jones. And maybe they even need a quarterback <laughs> when it comes to that as well. There are rumors that the the Giants rash is doing extensive homework on all the quarterbacks in this draft. And they're in the prime spot at number six to potentially take one of the top five guys. And I say five because Michael Penix Jr. has picked up steam. He's my quarterback three actually in this draft. I think everybody's biggest question for him was the medical. And it seems like that is cleared. So honestly, when you turn on the tape, he's a top three quarterback in this draft. So could he potentially be in the running at number six? I think they truly need a, a true number one receiver. I also think they need a corner. They need corner help as well. Um, have a pretty good defensive line. Traded for Brian Burns, which was a big, you know, free agent. I want to say free, a big trade acquisition for them to really help on the edge. And him and Dexter Lawrence, that's going to be fun football to actually watch. So, um, I mean, safety is another position they could attack as well because they did lose Xavier McKinney as well. But I think receiver and corner are their biggest needs right now because they did sign – Ringing and Illuminor this offseason to try to sure up that offensive line. It'll be interesting to see what they do with Evan Neal, though, Breach. Will he compete with Illuminor, or will they potentially try to move him inside? Uh, I think only time will tell. Yeah, and, and, you know, you mentioned the defensive front. It's it's kind of scary how good this defensive front could be this year. It right. could be a situ- not that the Giants are going to win the Super Bowl, but they're <laughs> kind of harkening back to the 20, 2017, the 2011 team where – we're going to let our pass rush kind of lead our team. But, you know, the thing I think that is the, the the craziest part of this is that I absolutely agree that the number one receiver feels like a huge hole. And what is your quarterback supposed to do when he doesn't have a number one receiver? So what do you really know about Daniel Jones? And I'm not saying he's a great quarterback, but you're not yeah. putting him in a position to succeed necessarily. So I think I would ask you, you have the sixth overall pick. Would you be looking to take a quarterback? Or would you say, you know what, why don't we try and get this number one receiver and then see what this offense can do when we actually have a top talent at that position. Well, it's kind of a, uh, kind of a conundrum, right? Because if you look at it, it's a similar situation that the Chicago Bears were in, right? Ryan Poles inherited a quarterback. HGM wants to be attached to a quarterback that they pick, whether it's free agency or through the draft, right? When you look at this, Joe Shane, same situation. He inherited Daniel Jones. He didn't pick Daniel Jones. Ryan Dable didn't pick Daniel Jones, who is this scenario where they like we've been with this guy two years. We've seen what we need to see. I think we if we have a chance to take a franchise guy and have him sit for a year, why not do that? Now, again, even if you sit this guy for a year, how do you expect to go out there and compete without a true number one receiver? Right. And maybe they they don't intend to compete. Maybe they, they you know, let's not forget Brian Dable was able to take this team to the playoff his first year in tight knit games. A lot of that had to do with Saquon Barkley, who was no longer in the fold. And I did bring in Devin Singletary, who I thought had a really good year for the Houston Texans last year. But to me, if you feel like there's a franchise quarterback and just knowing how GMs and head coaches think that you can attach your name to, that you think can really run your system well, I think they're going to lean to take a quarterback at number six, right? I could even see the Giants potentially maybe trying to get aggressive. We'll see what happens. But if a guy falls at him at six, and I know a lot of the Giants fans, you know, the J.J. McCarthy thing, They've been upset about that, but they've done like extensive work on him, Drake May, and also uh, Michael Penix Jr. If one of those three or all three fall to them, I think it's going to be hard pressed for the Giants not to take a quarterback, Brees. All right, we're going from a team that might take a quarterback in the first round to a team that will definitely be taking a quarterback in the mm-hmm. first round, and that is the Washington Commanders. They have had a busy offseason. They fired their coach. They oh, hired Lord. Dan Quinn. I think they've signed more players 
than anyone else. 20 I players, I think. <laughs> 20, it's like every time I woke up for the past two weeks or since free agent started, it was the commander signed a new player. And it's just like, how are there any players left to sign? They have everyone. It's over. You can stop signing people, Washington. Uh, exactly. So considering the fact that they signed 20 new players, uh, what do you think is still left as their biggest need? I mean, Adam Peters and Dan Quinn went to work, Brees, in regards to really turning over this, this roster. Because when you think about it, right, it's a 53-man roster. I think 47 play on game day. They've signed 20 guys to this roster. You said 20 new guys will be making this team, right? So it's just like insane when you look at it. And Dan Quinn being a defensive-minded coach, he brought some friends from Dallas, obviously, right? When you look at what they've done with Doris Armstrong, Dante Fowler, bringing those guys on. I, I, I've been telling people for the longest, Frankie Louvu was my favorite signing in free agency. Ooh. And I'm not calling him Michael Parsons, but if you've seen – if you, you probably haven't been able to watch him because he played for the Jets and Panthers – but if you see his skill set, he's a great rusher on the edge. I know, I'm, you know, I'm a Jets guy, so I can say that. Uh, he's a great rusher on the edge, plays with a different type of physicality, right? He's going to bring a different physicality to that defense that Dan Quinn is going to love. And I guarantee you he uses him like he used Michael Parsons with Dallas, right? So you talked about 20 signings. They had to rectify that offensive line. They got Tyler Biotis signed, Nick Allegretti, who has Super Bowl experience as well. Um, they've done a really good job. So when you look at this roster – I think corner makes a lot of sense because they did lose Fuller in the offseason. Quarterback is the obvious one, right? They need a quarterback first and foremost. But besides quarterback, because we're already saying that's obvious, I think getting a third receiver because they did lose uh, Curtis Samuel to the Buffalo Bills makes a lot of sense in the cornerback position attacking that. You know, you mentioning these moves that you like. It, I'm not going to say the commanders are going to make the playoffs this season, but it really feels like what the Texans did last offseason – where they made a lot of smart free agent signings and it yep. everything was going to hinge on the quarterback they drafted and how yep. well <laughs> it ended up being C.J. Stroud, obviously, and then how well was he going to play in his rookie year, and he looked phenomenal. And so if the commanders draft a quarterback that plays C.J. Stroud-level football, they become a contender. That's saying a lot, though. C.J. Stroud, to me, was the top five quarterback last year. <laughs> yeah, that's not something you usually get from a rookie. But, I, I mean, you mentioned – Frankie Louvre, but they, they signed so many defensive guys on these kind of one-year prove-it deals where Dan Quinn's yeah. thinking, I can mold them into something I want to see on defense, whether it's Cleveland Farrell or Dante Fowler. Bobby Wagner, I think, could play well for them. So, yeah, yeah and like you said, quarterback is the obvious one. Uh, who do you think they're going to end up taking? To me, it just makes sense for Jaden Daniels. When you look at um, their offensive coordinator, Cliff Kingsbury, and where he's come from and his history as far as the spread and having a quarterback that has mobility. Now, a lot of people have said, could they try to potentially trade up to one because he worked with them in Caleb Williams? I don't think Chicago Bears are listening to anybody at the number one overall pick. I think it's kind of solidified that he's going number one. But I think Caleb, to me, not Caleb, Jaden is the most dynamic quarterback when you talk about how explosive he is as a runner. And to me, he has the most common presence in the pocket, which – it's rare for a guy that has that type of ability running the football. I think he does mechanically things that other quarterbacks in this draft don't do as far as his calm and his presence, his footworks. And he's a better thrower than people are actually giving him credit for, right? Yes, he had two good receivers, but they didn't say that about Joe Burrow when he had two good receivers, right? He does things in the pocket that are like boring fundamental-wise, but things that you need to do to have success. We saw C.J. Stroud. Right. He was a guy that fundamentally was better than every other quarterback in that draft last year. I think that was lost. People got enamored with the all platform of Bryce Young and the processing. But being able to play the position, right, the fundamentals behind it, the boring stuff. Jaden Daniels does that well. And he has the explosive ability as a runner. I think with Cliff Kingsbury, it just makes sense for him to go to a raw. I think that most people probably agree that Caleb Williams is probably the most polished quarterback in the draft. Do you yeah. think Jaden Daniels has the highest ceiling? Oh. To me, ooh, that's a good question. I think Caleb has the highest ceiling because the things that I just talked about, he can do. We've seen it on tape as far as processing and getting the ball out of his hands, throwing in time and rhythm. And then obviously the things people get enamored with is him outside the pocket, some of the wild throws. But we've seen it on tape of him living within the structure of the offense and doing it. We just need to see it more consistently. With Jaden Daniels, I'm not saying you, you know what you're going to get. I think he does have a lot of upside. 
but we've actually seen him live within the, the, the construct of the offense. And then when nothing's there, we see him take it off. Like where, where Caleb, I think he was pressing so much last year where he would get off the progression and take off and try to be Mr. Superman. You didn't really see that from Jaden Daniels. All right, that is the end of our NFC East breakdown. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we are going to finish up the final two divisions in the NFC. Last dance. I shall follow your lead. We're on a search for one of the greatest powers ever known. Let's fly. All right, dudes, we get to talk about everyone's favorite division because no one can win 10 games in this division. So it's <laughs> always close, always fun to talk about. It is the NFC South. Look, we saw the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, they literally just went to everyone who was up for a contract extension, said, resign, resign, <laughs> resign. <much. laughs> Thanks for getting in line. Bye, guys. So we know they have a lot of last year's roster coming back. What yeah. else do you think they need to do right now? What's their biggest need? Yeah, Breeze, they did a lot of business with some homegrown players. We talk about Mike Evans and then Baker Mayfield, who wasn't homegrown, but kind of embodied what the, the Bucks were trying to be going forward. And then they also franchise tag Antoine Winfield Jr. When you look at this team, I think trading away Carlton Davis was a, a, a big loss for them. Um, I think corners the major need for this team. Also some edge help, right? They lost Shaq Barrett. Um, they had to cut him because his cap number – was so high. I think they need somebody opposite of Yaya Diaby. Joe Tryon has been a good supplemental piece. I think he could be a third guy, but I think they need to draft a guy also that could potentially be a starter. Need some help on the D-line and, and potentially O-line. So they have a lot of holes as well. I think more interior offensive line, they need some help with an interior D-line. But their major needs to me is corner and edge defender. Yeah, it is weird the trade away Carlton Davis, and I think they signed Amik Robertson, uh, you know, who's a spot starter for the Raiders, played a lot. Well, no, 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 he went to, remember, he went to Detroit. Oh, yeah, yeah, so you're still. So they'll be together in Detroit, yep. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm, looking at, I got my Carlton Davis, uh, Robertson, the Buccaneers traded, Rob, or uh, <laughs> Davis. traded Carlton Davis to the Lions. Yeah. yeah, no, I was looking at who he was paired with. Um, yeah, but with, with the Buccaneers, they definitely need edge help when you're, uh, you let Jack Barrett walk in free agency, Devin white. And obviously we saw Devin white has been all over the place. He yeah. had a couple years where he looked great. Didn't look so good last year, but I feel like the good news, if you're going to have two weaknesses in the NFC South, maybe pass rushing and corner aren't so bad. Cause it's not like, you, have, <laughs> you know, it's not like Bryce Young's dicing you up for 400 yards. You have Kirk cousins coming off the torn Achilles. And, of course, Derek Carr still Derek seems Carr, like he's learning yeah. the ropes of the Saints offense. So, yeah, I definitely agree with you. Those are the two biggest needs. But, you know, if you're playing in the AFC West and those are the two biggest needs, or, or you're going against Lamar Jackson, Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, if you're in the AFC, those are two rough needs. But the AFC South, uh, they could win the division even with the roster they have right now. Uh, all right, let's go to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, look. They were in cap hell this offseason. The really only thing they've done is <laughs> every sign. Year. Yeah, every year. They just <laughs> keep kicking the can ahead. Uh, but they did manage to sign Chase Young. That's about all they've done. What do you think their biggest remaining need is? Yeah, it's offensive tackle without a doubt. They need to actually take a, a, fly, a flyer and try to draft two or three offensive tackles. Because when you look at Ryan Ramchek, there's question marks whether he could even play again, right? So, And then Trevor Penning, who they took a few years in the first – a few years ago in the first round, has really struggled – at the left tackle position. So offensive tackle, offensive tackle, offensive tackle for the Saints. And then when you look at it, receiver could be they did lose Mike Thomas, even though he hasn't been himself the last three three years. I, I really love Olave and Rashid Shaheed. But I think they could add one receiver, more, one more receiver. Now they did sign Cedric Wilson, who was an underrated signing for me. I really like his game as well. And then maybe safety, they did lose Marcus May. And corner, they lost Isaac Yedem, but they still have Paulson Debo. And then um, what's my other guy? Marshawn Lattimore. Um, I think getting another corner in there and another safety makes sense. But again, Brees, I would not be surprised if their first two picks are offensive tackles. <laughs> yeah, it's really crazy, the Ryan Ramchak stuff, because it kind of came out of nowhere that, you know, yeah. he was dealing with a knee thing. But to, it's we're in April, and we're talking about him maybe missing the entire 2024 season. Correct. And that is just – you know, that's a tough thing to come back from. Fortunately, the Saints are getting this news before the draft. And, and yeah. like you said, uh, 
they're picking 14th overall, and they're in a it's a it's a very deep draft when it comes to tackles. About to take a good tackle. So who, who, do, you, who do you like? Who are you, who are you sending to New Orleans? Who's gonna, so who's gonna that that's that sweet area where I was talking about Troy Fontenew, Talise Fawaga make a lot of sense in that area too. We already uh, sent him to Seattle, dudes. We sent him to Seattle. Okay, well, I mean, oh, if Talise Fawaga is there, if the Jets don't take him at 10. It makes a lot of sense there, too. J.C. Latham is another guy. Some people may be like, that's a little rich, but I don't think it is. I think J.C. Latham, especially if you're trying to change the attitude of that team, it makes a lot of sense there as well. Yeah, and you know, it's funny because you mentioned receiver and offensive tackle. You have Derek Carr. This is what makes me iffy on the Saints is that, look, Derek Carr is not good under pressure, and if he doesn't have receivers to throw to, how can you trust him to run that offense? So. It's going to be tough. So uh, they they were the team, Breeze, when we were doing, like, grades. Uh, people asked me, like, what was the one team that you would say are losers of free agency? I said the Saints. Because, like, there's, they're always in cap purgatory. And there's no way you see what the Bucks and the Falcons did, and even the Panthers, and just stay pat with your team thinking that you're going to make a run. Like, what, what are they doing? Like, eventually, you got to stop kicking the can down the road. You know, take your tussin, or as my mom said, take your medicine and struggle for one year and get off of them off of those contracts <laughs> yeah and or do what the, the rams kind of did that they said hey we're gonna take these huge dead cap hits we'll hope the rookies can carry us and the rookies did carry them that's what you have to do you gotta just say you exactly. know what we're gonna survive with our rookie class one year all right let's move to the atlanta falcons what a wild off season they have had uh they have new quarterback i'm sure you heard about that his name is <laughs> cousins they and do. They did. They did a lot. They have new weapons for Kirk Cousins. Darnell Mooney's there. Uh, what do you think their biggest need is? They still need to do. Yeah, Edge without a doubt at the number eight pick. I think Dallas Turner is the pick. Arnold Ebicady, who they took a few years ago, took a big step last year. But they need to pair him with some somebody on the opposite side. D line could be Grady Jarrett getting up there in age. David Anyamata getting up there in age. They could potentially take that or even corner. Right? You need somebody opposite of AJ Terrell. Clark Phillips can play in the slot, but I think you need another corner. And then I would say receiver, but the Randell Moore, you know, trade kind of solidified that with Darnell Mooney as well. And then, you know, you still have Drake London at receiver as well. So to me, their biggest thing is edge defending, especially with Raheem Morris defense. You need somebody that can create havoc off the edge. Yeah, it's really interesting to me that they haven't really done anything on defense. Obviously, you mentioned Kirk Cousins, Darnell Mooney, Rondell Moore. Uh, Ray Ray McLeod. So they've added three yeah. receivers. They added a quarterback. They signed a tight end, uh, Charlie Warner. And then you have obviously mm -hmm. Kyle Pitts, Drake London. You mentioned London. So you have all these offensive weapons and you have this defensive coach who just didn't really say, Hey, we're going to go out and get these studs. And I feel like it's hard to be a defensive minded head coach when you don't have a good pass rush. And yeah. it doesn't seem like the Falcons have that right now. So you think that would be the obvious thing they do at number eight? Yeah, for sure. I think, again, Dallas Turner makes too much sense. A guy that, you know, grew up in Florida but went to Alabama, which isn't that far from the ATL. And we look at Raheem Morris. He, he did kind of inherit a pretty good defense. I think they were middle of the pack and at times played better than middle of the pack defense. I think Jesse Bates was a major get in free agency. We The Bengals are probably kicking themselves from letting him walk out, especially with the failed experiment with Dax Hill and other guys at the safety position in Cincinnati. So when you look at it, Raheem Morris says, I got some foundational piece. I got Grady Jarrett right in the middle. I also have A.J. Terrell on the outside. I have Jesse Bates. I have some foundational pieces. I just need to add a couple guys here in the draft, and we'll get back to playing like we did when we were with the Rams. And you talked about all the offensive weapons. If Kirk can just steer the ship, I, I think they, them and the Bucks have to be the two favorites to win the – NFC South. Yeah, and that's the thing. And adding offensive weapons can help the defense because you're not going three and out all the time. The defense yeah. is actually getting some rest. Or, or turning the ball over as much as Desmond Ritter was. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I think that maybe that is part of the plan. Let's move to the final team in the NFC South. Uh, I don't know what they're doing. Brinson thinks they're having a good off season. What do you think? Dude? Well, at first he was mad, but I think they've actually for what for where they were at. It's been a respectable offseason for them because you go from losing Brian Burns, which for the life of me, you could have got two first round picks from him a few years ago. My thing is yeah. if you weren't going to pay him, why not do it? But if you look at what they've done, 
right? They brought in DJ Wanham. They signed to Davion Clowney. They signed Chase Son, right? Traded for Deontay Johnson. They needed a receiver. A lot of the issues that they had, they brought in two offensive guards and paid them top dollar money to protect Bryce Young, especially in the middle, right? Because that's where that interior pressure comes quicker than anything. They solidified those guard spots. So I actually think they've had a, a respectable offseason, which at first when I saw that they were losing Brian Burns and Jeremy Chen and Frankie Luvu, I'm like, hold on, the defense was the strength of your team. Why are you letting all your best players walk out the door? But they were they signed some respectable players to replace them. So I, I'm not mad at the Panthers offseason. I just – the way they got there was bizarre. Is I think it's the biggest thing, Breach. Yeah, and I think just the fact that the Brian Burns trade came so early kind of left a bad taste in everyone's mouth. As you said, Brinson did a pretty good job of selling on why it has been a decent offseason for them so far. And You mentioned the guard signings. Robert Hunt got the $100 million contract. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> and those – you can't have – and the other one was Damian Lewis. You can't have those yeah. two blow up in your face. So you, you, Bryce Young can't be on his back every play when Correct. you're spending $150 million uh, on your guys. I, I do think they probably could use some tight end help, and I know you mentioned – I was going to say tight Thompson. end for sure. Yeah. yeah, tight end and receiver. So you need to just yeah. get Bryce Young somewhere. You got him the offensive line. So now he's going to have time to throw, but who's he throwing to? Uh, and what's going to happen – I think their first pick is into the second round, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Xavier Leggett, if he's there, man, makes a lot of sense for them. It, Homegrown guy, too. That uh, So you have, let's see, the Panthers. Whew. Do you think they did enough to contend for the division, or do you think? No, oh, no, nah, nah, this is a process with uh, – with, with with Mr. Canales this is with Dave Canales. It's gonna take it's gonna take some uh, take a while to build this thing the, the right way. Um, even though they did bring in some some quality players, right? It's all about meshing and gelling. It's gonna take it's gonna take at least uh, I would say two years for them to even be talked about in regards to maybe competing for the NFC South. Dudes, are you telling me you are not gonna sprinkle any money on Carolina to win the Super Bowl? Not at all. <laughs> not at all. All right, well, we'll go to a team that maybe you will sprinkle some money on to win the Super Bowl, and that is because we are headed to the NFC North and the Detroit Lions. It has been uh, an interesting offseason. They've made some big moves. We mentioned the Carlton Davis trade earlier. Uh, they got DJ Reader from Cincinnati. I thought that was a huge signing. What do you think their biggest need is left? Yeah, to, to me, it's for sure edge and corner. The Cam Sutton news that just came out, they did trade for Carlton Davis, brought a Meek Robinson in, but they still need one more corner because, you know this, Brees, most teams are in 11 personnel, which is three receivers, one tied in. So you got to be able to have another corner to match up. And then edge. Somebody needs to help Aiden Hutchinson on the other side. For the last few years, we thought it would be James Houston. We saw him take a step his rookie year, was banged up last year, never really got back to what he was doing his rookie year. I think Edge makes a lot of sense at the back of the first round. Could it be Dar Darius Robinson, the guy that can move up and down the line of scrimmage, or a guy like Chop Robinson, who has the most explosive first step in this draft, makes a lot of sense. And then maybe in that second round, you take a corner. Yeah, I think with the Lions, and they're picking a spot, they're not used to uh, drafting so low down here. Be so, so late. <laughs> yeah, with that 29th overall pick. And, you know, the interesting thing about corner is that, look, they made the trade for Carlson Davis. They signed Amik Robertson. They made both those moves before the Cam Sutton yeah. stuff happened. So they already knew they needed corners, and now they're back down a corner from what they originally <laughs> planned. So it's like, okay, we're back at square one. I would be surprised if they take a corner in the first round just because of how that all played out. But I do agree with you. I do think uh, edge makes sense, but I would not be surprised if, you know, one of those corners falls into their lap that they take someone there. So, well, you you also got to remember Brian Branch plays a lot in the slot too, right? So, like they they like their three safeties. Brian Branch has the flexibility to move into the slot. So, for day one, they're good, but the depth is a question mark. That's why I say I think in the second round it makes a lot of sense. I think Edge is the more pressing need for them right now. All right, let's move to. The Green Bay Packers. One thing they do not need is a quarterback because this team never needs a Ooh. quarterback. They just always have yeah. a quarterback. It's unbelievable. <laughs> uh, they do need someone to protect their quarterback, though. We saw David yeah. Bakhtiari uh, not returning to Green Bay. He had been there forever. So is that their biggest need? Is the offensive line, or do you think it's somewhere else? 
Yeah, I think it's offensive tackle for sure. They need an offensive tackle to replace David Bakhtiari, even though he really hasn't played that much the last few years. And it lo- they did lose Devondre Campbell, so they could use a linebacker, cornerback. You know, Jair Alexander is out there. Stokes is too, but they need a third corner. And then even safety, they did sign Xavier McKinney, but they need to pair him with somebody because they lost Darnell Savage in free agency. So offensive tackle to me is the biggest need. And then from there, they can kind of do – best player available or attack some of these position groups like linebacker and corner. Yeah, it does feel like they're in a good spot too with uh, the 25th overall pick. And and I definitely agree with linebacker because they really, if you look at their inside linebackers uh, with Quay Walker and Isaiah yeah. McDuffie, and those are the only two guys with real experience. So you don't have Correct. much behind them. And so I, I won't be surprised if we see them add some uh, linebacker depth in the draft, but you know what? They're the Packers. They don't have too many holes and they have a quarterback of the future. So, Everyone hates Green Bay because they always have a quarterback. Let's <laughs> go to uh, who's next. Let's go to the Minnesota Vikings. They don't have a Kirk's quarterback. Kirk's old team. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kirk's old team. Uh, I mean, that seems like their biggest need, right? Quarterback? Oh, without a doubt. I don't even think it's questionable. I think close second is corner. Uh, well, I won't say close second because if you don't have a quarterback, you don't have a chance. Now, they did sign Sam Darnold this offseason, so maybe you could be a bridge guy. But I think corner, you know, they needed to pair somebody with Byron Murphy for sure. And edge could be a position, right? They lost both of their edge players from last year. Daniel Hunter left and also uh, DJ Wanham left as well. So they did sign John DeGrenard and Van Ginkle. It'll be interesting knowing his history with Brian Flores. Where does he play him? Does he play him at the outside and in the inside linebacker? Uh, that's the flexibility he gives you, and they, they did sign Aaron Jones, who was released from the Green Bay Packers, so they kind of shored up the running back spot. So I think, to me, it's quarter, quarterback, corner, edge, and then maybe, maybe interior offensive line. Yeah, I actually like the Van Ginkle signing just because you have the Flores connection, and, and Flores has done real good as a defensive coordinator. He's real good at putting his chess pieces where they need to be. Uh, I'm going to mention a need that dudes would never mention, and that's that kicker. Uh, they, they, <laughs> they let – Greg Joseph walking. That is the agency. true. Their only guy on the roster is John Parker Romo, who has never kicked in an NFL regular season game. And you, mm. when you have a rookie kicker or a guy who's never kicked in a regular season game, there always needs to be some uneasiness and some iffiness. We saw some rookie kickers miss big kicks. It, they're high pressure situations, and you do not yeah. know how somebody is going to react until they are in that situation. Yeah. So I think it'll be interesting to see what the Vikings do at kicker, uh, whether they get sign a free agent, draft one, who knows. All right, dudes, we're down to our final team. And our final team just happens to have the number one overall pick in this year's draft. It is the Chicago Bears. They have been busy in free agency. What do you still think they need to do? I mean, obviously, it's quarterback. So do we we probably don't even have to talk about that. Everybody assumes that Caleb Williams is going to be the number one pick for the Chicago Bears going forward, especially since they traded away. Justin Fields. I think their next biggest need is edge. I need they need somebody to pair with Montez Sweat. We saw Breeze, this defense take off when they made that trade for Montez Sweat. Matter of fact, last six weeks of the season, they were number one in points per game given up, number one in interceptions, and number one in regards to giving up rushing touchdowns. They were the number one rush defense in all the football all last year. So uh if you have somebody that can pair with Montez Sweat, just imagine what he did last year with somebody on the other side to take the attention away from him, I think makes a lot of sense for the Chicago Bears. Then another receiver, yes, they traded for Keenan Allen, but he's only got one year left on his deal. He's getting up there in, in, in years, and DJ Moore is a really good player. But I think you need a third receiver just because you lost Arnell Mooney as well. So an offensive tackle could be a position, but I, I'm really high on Braxton Jones, and they took Darnell Wright last year. So that could be like somebody they take in the third, fourth round. I will take an L on the Montez sweat trade because I was one of those people who said, why are you doing this, Chicago? His contract is expiring. You're going I nowhere. The franchise is it. at rock bottom. <laughs> and and as you mentioned, he completely turned that defense around. And you get him a little help, give him pass rushing help on the other side, and it, it maybe a little interior defensive line help. I think both those things would be good. I do think the interesting one is receiver, as you mentioned, uh, even though they have Keenan and DJ Moore that, like you said, Keenan's leaving and – the fact that you brought him in, though, I think you don't have to take a receiver until maybe the third round. You don't have to rush Correct. it because you got that solid second receiver in there. Dudes, we did it. We finished our first podcast together. What would you grade us? A minus? I think we got to get an A plus, man. We covered okay. a lot. Man. We literally covered a lot. We covered every team's need in the NFC. 
NFC teams, if you're listening, me and Breach just laid out the blueprint for you. Tune in to the first pick podcast. Not the first. Oh, I'm so sorry. Pick six podcast. You know why I messed that up? Because I literally just got off with the first pick podcast. So it messed my head up, Breach. So my bad. Pick six podcast. We got all your answers for every NFC team and what they need going into the draft. Dudes, at least you said another CBS Sports podcast and not some random other podcast. <laughs> All right, we did the 16 NFC teams today. We will be doing, me and Tyler Saul will be doing the 16 AFC teams on Thursday, so make sure you tune in. Uh, remember to subscribe. Hit the like button. Do all that fun stuff that makes this podcast more popular. Leave us five-star review. Dudes loves you. I love you. We'll see you all, guys, on Thursday.